In the Marine Corps, training isn't something you do just once. Marines are continuously training and improving their skills, from physical fitness to rifle qualifications and beyond. They deepen their knowledge of military strategy through formal education programs and professional development. In addition, they train on how to use our gear properly and effectively. The Marine Corps Training and Education Command is tasked with equipping Marines with the knowledge and training necessary for the fight. TCOM provides unit, collective, and service level training to enhance warfighting organizations that enable the fleet Marine Force to build and sustain the combat readiness required to fight and win today and in the future. Its Range and Training Programs Division through Range and Training Area Management executes integrated programs for range, systems, and training environments to achieve the TCOM mission. Today, we're joined by Carlos Hathcock, head of TCOM's Range Safety and Design that is a part of Range and Training Area Management. Welcome, Carlos. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's, it's awesome to have you here. I've been trying to get you on the podcast for a while and glad we could make this happen. So you and I have worked together for a long time, but for those who don't know you, tell us a bit about yourself. So I'm a retired Marine, retired as a gunnery sergeant in uh, 20, 2005, was picked up as a government civilian six months after I retired, and I've been working with TCOM ever since. We're glad to have you on the team, you know, over at TCOM and uh, we look forward through this podcast to, to hearing like what you do. So before we get to that, I believe you're an avid fisherman as well. And so can you tell us a little bit about that? So what I learned as I was getting ready to retire was that I needed something else to occupy my time. Uh, and and being in the Northern Virginia area, shooting is not as easy as fishing. So I kind of went down the fishing route because of all the accessibility to water. Plus, I've got picked up a bunch of friends uh, that kind of have gravitated towards that, not just the shooting community. So what's the favorite fish in the area to, to go for? Anything that bites, right? Different times of the year, different fish are doing different things. So anything that bites or sometimes when they're not just enjoying getting out and away from the stress of work. Is a snakehead as tasty as they say? Absolutely. Oh, all right. Well, good deal. Good deal. Because I hear that all the time. Yes. So. Yep. Yep. All right. So tell me some about your experience as a shooter and your participation in the Marine Corps Distinguished Shooters Association. So I started shooting in 1985. I've uh, been in for a little bit. And at that time, there was still a lot of, it, when I was a young kid, uh, still in the Marine Corps at the time. So I kind of re-met them as a Marine vice being the kid. And I started shooting. So I started shooting at Cherry Point um, with the M14. So I started off with the M14 uh, in competition with a lot of dad's folks that had been there. I had started shooting there and kind of gravitated towards it. Uh, I will definitely say that I was a much better prone shooter than I was a standing shooter. Uh, so started shooting, ended up coming up to the Marine Corps rifle team at the time. So spent some time there as a competitor instructor, and then also got to, to spend some time as the head coach. So now that's all open. Um... Iron sights, shooting. So at the time, it was mostly iron sights. Some of the long range stuff was scoped. 300 wind mag, that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. uh, some of what the Marine Corps is wanting to do now. So we shot some 300 wind mag, also some 762 Palma, uh, thousand yards type stuff with iron sights as well. Okay, but you say, do they still shoot iron sights now, even when they're doing just in general, or is it only the long range stuff? It's that's primarily. Long range doing the scope stuff up close now with, with the optics and how things have changed since then, right? It, it's really become a little bit more optics focused. So what has been your favorite memory during your time in the Marine Corps as a Marine or as a civilian? What, what's been your favorite? So I've actually struggled with trying to figure out a, a good answer for this one because there's so many, right? And, and you know the deal, you go through a career uh, and especially a Marine Corps career, because you, you start off as getting impressions um, as a young Marine. Some of my young Marine impressions, I, I directly look back because, of, again, who my dad was, who a lot of the guys that I grew up as a kid with, and it's seen for the shooting bit. So I got a ton of good memories on shooting uh, with a lot of Marine Corps legends uh, in the shooting community. Then personally as a Marine, you know, leading Marines, working with Marines, there, there's nothing better that ha that I've been fortunate to enjoy. Well, I was flying, uh, you know, with a squadron uh, at, during my crew chief stint, right. or whether I was doing support equipment as as a mechanic and being NCIC of a shop, 
you know, 60 Marines. So there, there's a... How do you pick just one out of all of that, right? Exactly, right? Because because each one, I get I get that mental flash of this time, that time, that Marine, those Marines, you know, the, so there, there's there's... There's there's a lot, and and this was also pre easy taking picture time frame with phones. So you know you kind of look back through some old pictures and things that were taken. And you're like, oh man, that was awesome. Uh, that was a very memorable time. Not so much fun. You know, you know. That, Not so that's awesome, fun. but memorable, right? Right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks. We'll move to the job side of uh, of this interview and say so. Tell us a little bit about uh, what it is, what's involved in the world of range and training management. So my my particular. Uh, Job requirement is I'm the head for range safety and design. So we're the Marine Corps proponent and institutional resource sponsor for range safety as well as range design. So as TCOM with range safety, we're I'm responsible particularly for uh, three Marine Corps orders. So I've got Marine Corps Order 3570, which is range safety, which is also a joint order with the Army. Uh, we've got the Marine Corps Order 3559 Alpha, which is for certification of ranges, and then 3550 which is operational range clearance. So all of that falls under range safety and design as what I do on a daily basis. As part of those, right, you can kind of pick the, the genre of range safety. So range safety is exactly kind of where we've run into each other in the past, right, which right. is you know, new things, old things, maybe a problem with something that's being used on a range by the Marines uh, that initially hadn't been talked about or thought about, as well as fielding some of the new stuff. Then you play into the range design because sometimes we use Marine Corps or the, the Marine in the Marine Corps is really good at getting something and then and having an unintended use for it. Right. And which makes it a better type system to be able to use. And our facilities have to be able to take that into account. And so when we're talking ranges, we're not just talking, you know, a, a shooting range. I mean, it's ranges and training areas. It's not just a pit that I go and stand in and shoot at 50 and 100 and 300 meters. It's that that is correct. So it can be as simple as right. So the the, the more simple things to think about is a known distance range. You know, two, three, five hundred yards or meters with a pit that I'm staying in and a target that does something to huge contiguous areas that we have, like within 29 Palms, uh, huge areas that we're doing combined arms or even some of the other ranges like we have, which are air ground ranges. So we're doing standoff, you know, uh, weapons from aircraft uh, from a nau few nautical miles away to, to hit a target within that range as well. So my range safety runs not just normal kinetic stuff. Um, it also does uh, the implementation and use of those non-kinetic things, high energy, th those types of stuff that happen within that area that's a range. I know you have lasers, um, you do shoot houses. Yes. And, okay. Yep, yep. I've been to the range once or twice myself, but I never, previous to meeting you, I'd never considered just all the planning and maintenance that goes into managing those areas. So if you were to kind of put this... I don't know, in layman's terms, what, what do you do there to help make sure that the, that the ranges and the training areas are safe and, and able to meet the mission of, uh, of training the Marines? When you use that facility, whatever it is, you know, it degrades. So the Marine Corps has a very good program. And, and I would assert at this point in time between the Marine Corps range program and how we've assimilated the system side of it, the maintenance side the, the range safety side, uh, as well as the systems that go on or within the range control, that cohesive program that the Marine Corps has is world-class. And, and as that world-class program, the three big sections that I just kind of described that are within range and training area management, th there's a lot of back and forth and discussion so that if we get a new weapon system the maintenance folks can make sure that we have the proper maintenance set up for around those new targets that, that those new weapon systems may engage, as well as the safety factors that are involved with it would like the the range systems for scheduling because you have to deconflict that new weapon system with all the other activities that's happening on that that facility at the time. You know, some of our our, our facilities have more than 300 live fire events a day. So there's a lot that goes on between the institutional view, right, which is what I do for safety and what uh, our other folks within RTAM do for scheduling, that the installation 
is also making sure that they're deconflicting those activities, right? So the external deconfliction as well as the internal. And then what the Marines are doing that they request this range to do something on this day. They might not even know there's another 299 events going on that day. They're concerned with their event. So it should make it easy for them. Show up, do your training, use whatever weapon system you need to do, and then and then kind of back off and leave and somebody else is gonna occupy. Right. You guys handle all of that. They don't need to, they don't need to worry about that. So when you say world class, that equates in my mind to Better than what the Army has. Is that what we're saying? Absolutely. All right. Uh, as well as, right, so again, that goes to my Marine Corps order, Army regulation thing for range safety, even though it's an Army regulation and a Marine Corps order. Um, but as, as part of my, also my day job, um, I'm the chairman right now for the NATO Range Safety Working Group. So that falls under the, the, the Land Service Board under NATO. So we've got a direct tie into NATO policy as that, because the Marine Corps has such an awesome program that we're able to take and showcase and show some of that to our NATO partners so that furthers interoperability. So the the day job for me, I've got an inward look for the Marine Corps. We always take care of our Marines, but because Marines don't always just train with us, their, their external training, right. Uh, right? Whether it's a theater security type exercise or something on that line that, that we help with ensuring that it's seamless, just like the, if they would come to a, a Marine Corps range, it should be seamless if they're going to go to a range in Slovenia or somewhere else within NATO. Right. We certainly want them to be safe and be able to get their training done yes. elsewhere in the world. So, all right. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're on top of all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's say I'm a Syscom project officer, right? So we're moving to the acquisition side. That's, uh, kind of, that's where the podcast tends to focus. So I'm a Syscom project officer for a new system. And I'm looking at, I want to con- come and conduct some new equipment training at the range. What do I need to do? What's the process going to look like on my end, your end, from the point where I make a request to you to be one of those 300 events on a day and to to when I set foot on your range? And then maybe beyond, I mean, is there after action and whatever? So what does that look like? So my request is to any PM that has something that's going to be used on a range or training area please communicate early and often. Early, early and often is the answer we get on, on a lot of things around here. And so I, I would, uh, you know, foot stomp that for the, for the PM types. Early and often, talk right. to the range folks. And, and, and that, that is especially true for something new, right? It, it's not necessarily a new bullet. Still communicate early and often if we're doing a new bullet or a weapon system. But when we're talking a whole new, like, genre of weapon systems or, or capabilities that are going to be brought directed energy, right? So we've been doing kinetic stuff since musketry, right? right? E- essentially. So we've got the process down. It's where we get some of these new systems that are being employed within a ranger training area that have all these different capabilities. One minute it might be, uh, you know, surveillance. The next minute it's a weapon system, you know, so all of those different things that play into it with the early and often we'll make sure that by the time the PM gets to go and they're fielding, we've already promulgated, sent out that proper range safety data. So that way it can be requested. And again, the unit never knows all of this other churn that's happened to make sure that we can ensure that all those other 300 events that are happening that day, that this new thing is deconflicted and we've got the proper data so that we can have a good danger zone. So, the, the danger zone piece and the data that comes from the PM is really where we we technically move into my my fun part of the job is looking at that type of data and, and, and analyzing it so that we can, to the standards that the Marine Corps has for safety, make sure that, that danger zone is in place, ready, the policy is signed. And, and we can then employ it and deconflict those activities with everything else. Right. So when you talk danger zone, so, I mean, right, with, uh, I mean, I know how that works with ordnance and stuff like that. I assume you're doing something similar with lasers, sound weapons, and things like that. What about, is there an environmental side to all of that that, that you have to worry about? There's a huge environmental and airspace side. Okay. Because in, in our, our current construct, uh, and especially I talked about, you know, range certification before the range certification package talks about what's an allowable activity on this range or training area. 
that the installation does. A huge part of that is the NEPA, is the environmental part, so that we've looked at it programmatically and legally to make sure that we're not going to cause any harm to the environment. And if we do, then what we have to do to either offset that or make sure that we take that environmental piece uh, into account. Same thing falls in with airspace because the big sky little bullet is not necessarily the methodology that, that is uh, as subscribed to by the Marine Corps. So we have to make sure that we've got adequate space for these things that whether again, if, whether it's directed energy, lasers, whatever, uh, has the proper airspace to operate in so that we can deconflict those activities with all the other civilian activities that, that's happening around every other range and installation that we have, especially in, in CONUS America. So when you say uh, big sky, little bullet, I'm reminded of a picture I saw when I was early on in my career in safety. And it's a picture of two bullets from um, uh, when uh, Britain was uh, trying to invade the uh, or help in Greece or wherever uh, during the uh, Second World War, and it's two bullets where one has pierced the other in the air, and presumably one of those bullets was incoming and one was outgoing, and when there's enough bullets going around, they will find each other eventually. Exactly, so. right, and that is what we don't want to have happen when we're training especially. So obviously we know that uh, the Marine Hymn and everything talks about Marines fighting in every climb and place, so that is just as true today as it was when you know, when those words for, were first written. So how do you account for the need to train in environments like jungle, desert, maybe some of which we don't see in North America to be able to train for, but how do you do that? And, and this is a, a great discussion. What we do for range safety, especially in range design, you try to match it for the area that you're actually having the range design going to be. Easy discussion would be, some of my control measures and, and things that I might have to take into account for a metal shoot house that's at 29 palms is going to be vastly different than if I was to have one in Guam, right? Okay. Environments are way different. So there's things that we have to make sure that the facility doesn't degrade, doesn't rust away when it's on Guam, you know, and then the frequency of use is going to be different when it's at 29 palms. So then you're looking at a frequency use thing. So we, we try to take that into account with policy as well as programs. Then when it comes to bullets, kinetic stuff, especially. So kinetic things, we try to make a, basically a one size fits all for a danger zone. So it doesn't necessarily matter where you're shooting it at because we want to have that containment of that hazardous activity. We do have it set up so that winds matter as well as elevation. Cause again, we know with, with bullets, the elevation matters or density. Right. So we have it set up on that one so it can be a little bit more tailored. But generally speaking, uh, we try to have a one-size-fits-all type danger zone. So again, it's easier on the Marine to design the training, deconflict that training uh, with the range control or if they're four deployed in training so that it, it's, it's an easy activity and they don't have to make this kabuki dance or science project to be able to complete the training that they want within the area that they're given to be able to train. Okay. And so you'll do that on Guam or any other host country that uh, where we need to train? That is correct. All right. So the systems that TCOM uses for training are quite often, at least, fielded or uh, impacted by Systems Command. What, what does that relationship look like? I was talking earlier about a world-class program uh, that our TAM has. As part of that is our relationship with Syscom because we would not be able to enable Marines training or even other countries training if it wasn't for the relationship that we have with your PMs, with your safety shop, as well as what my section and, and folks do for creating and developing these range safety things that go along with the systems that y'all are, are, are fielding. That discussion relationship is, is again, world class because I deal with a lot of other services and other countries programs and their program managers and some of the range safety and they don't enjoy, and I use that word on purpose, the relationship that, that TCOM, RTAM has with SISCOM and TRACES as well. Okay. You know, that, that discussion, sometimes it's rather heated and or uh, pointed, but it still gets us to the end state of we're able to communicate what we're needed. The PMs understand what's needed. They try to get us the data, even though that 
if we do it early and often, the data request is much easier to accommodate than later. Um, but that relationship is what enables when, when the PM says field this weapon system and you go into your fielding plan, you're doing your new equipment training, it, it's, just, it's just part of the process now. And nothing else happens other than the Marines and your net team are able to go out there and use this thing on a ranger training area. Now, you gave a shout out in the middle there to PM training systems. Uh, so kudos, Traces. And so if you could, I don't know, give us a little bit of uh, what you get from Traces. But then uh, can you tell us, like, give us some examples of other program offices? Because anybody that's going to come out and do net, they might have different things to, to come and bring to your ranges. So talk to us a little bit about Traces and then maybe some examples from other program offices. Right. So Traces, uh, you know, has been the one really big lately on the range safety side, uh, fielding a lot of the force on force type systems. So that discussion, because it's not often right that this is kind of a, an anomaly in the range safety world because we're actually aiming at Marines by other Marines and generally speaking in training uh, with the other kinetic stuff that we deal with, that's not what you want to do. And in this case, quite often with weapon systems that really aren't, weren't designed by the U S because when we're doing force on force, we're trying to use, um, you know, the op four there is going to be using a weapon that would be more appropriate to whomever the bad guy is going to be in in a theater. So that, that, that is correct. So that creates a unique safety discussion because now you're trying to save something that hasn't gone through the formal fielding process that we use within the Marine Corps. So then all the risk and the safety that goes along with it, you're trying to work your way through it for something that's like, no kidding, non-standard. So the non-standard piece is where a lot of the skull sweat has to come in between who, who understands the weapon system, what we're trying to do to make it conformal so that we can have conformal, concise, clear safety guidance that's associated with the system. And then we talk about what the system device information is as it pertains to range safety. So there's a lot of back and forth that happens between uh Traces and us to be able to get to that end state. So that, that's another good relationship that we have, and we're able to work through those. And, and to Traces' credit, you know, they understand that they're working a system piece. We work the range safety piece, and policy wise, we'll support them as well as they're supporting us. So there, there's definitely supported supporting uh, discussions that happen there so that we can get to the end state of fielding this piece for the Marine Corps for them to be able to train with it. Okay, so what about an example of a, of a non-TRACIS collaboration that you've been a member of? So one of the great success, success stories that we've had with, with you all here is a lot of the kinetic weapon systems that we have. Uh, you know, there's a new sniper rifle that's been fielded, lots of capability within that, lots of discussion back and forth between you guys and us with the ammunition that's going to be used, how it's going to be used for training, you know, whether they have to zero the weapon, right, for the go to war round with it. Those discussions are another huge success that a lot of the other services don't enjoy as well, is, is exactly that. We know early what, what the, the weapon's going to be. We're involved in the down select, you know, and, and what you guys are doing for the procurement so that we're on the sideline and we know once it comes to the end state of this is what the Marine Corps is going to procure, then we're able to make sure that with that PM, we're getting all the data that we need so that it can be fielded again. So with PMIW, they are right here. You're less than a mile away with Traces, obviously, those lucky dogs are down in Florida enjoying <laughs> great weather. Right. But uh, but at least, uh, you know, the, the travel is not bad there up here occasionally. So. And, and that definitely does facilitate, right? And, and what I've learned, so the old dude in me with this whole COVID thing and remote work and all that, what I've learned is there's definitely a, a a way to work some of the remote stuff, but a lot of this face to face is what really brings out a lot of this technical stuff. Because once you start getting into, let me rephrase, my experience that I've seen, once you start getting into some of these highly technical areas that deal with what the weapon's doing, what the bullet's doing, a lot of that's better face to face because then you can, people have a less tendency to just clam up and move on then actually walk through or talk through some of the really highly technical stuff that engineers do, right? Uh, so that, that is the success story and makes it easy for us to 
come over here or y'all come over there to, to where we're at to be able to work out some of these. Especially if you're able to, to hold a physical model of whatever the device is going to be. And I think that uh, as much as you said, you know, we use a lot of um, remote teams and Zoom calls and right. whatever. But uh, but I think that being able to look somebody in the eye and, and shake a hand um, really helps a lot. Especially there's a lot of trust insofar as what our program offices are telling you. You have to trust them in many cases to know that what they're telling you is true. Otherwise, when you get on the range, it's just not going to be what's expected. Exactly. So, yep. So technology has evolved, I don't know, exponentially over I don't know, the past 20, 30 years. What we saw when we were kids is very different than, uh, than what we're doing now. How has training kept up with that increase in technology? So training is definitely keeping up with it. And, and the systems that are being developed are, are keeping up with it. The, the challenge comes in from the range safety side because a lot of things that we are stepping into artificial intelligence, um, you know, swarming type weapon systems, all of those different things technology wise change a little bit of the answer because when you, again, I'll use kinetics. Kinetics are complicated, but the process is very sound. So to me, it's easy to do kinetic stuff. But as soon as you throw in artificial intelligence, you just throw in software that's doing something to control it to make it safe. My concernometer for non-participants goes up because then we have to make sure that that weapon system, which has a lot of capability, doesn't leave the confined area that we say that we're going to conduct our training, right? Because all of those other activities that are happening on ranges and training areas, we, we are deconflicting that. So when you start throwing some of those things, it's not a tangible, right? You can't tell the Marine, point your weapon that away. That's your target. That's your lateral limits. When these things are either communicating amongst themselves or they're saying, I'm geofenced. I have to stay within this area, right? All of those different considerations is where technology is helping us, but it also changes the risk discussion and the risk decision when it comes to safing that activity internally and externally. It's tough to understand just how often will the software fail as well. And so, uh, right, you can have all the engineers in the world saying, look, we've we've uh, set up software interlocks to keep this from happening. But, you know, I mean, I run programs on my computer and they crash all the time. So, so I get that. So, Carlos, so we've talked a whole bunch about technology and Systems Command is always trying to stay abreast of the latest technology uh, to make sure that our systems are as up to date as possible. What part does industry play on your end in maintaining and modernizing the facilities that you're responsible for? That's an awesome question because on the range safety side, especially in concert with your PMs, industry is a huge partner. Uh, industry is the ones for us that might have an idea or a thought process for something right, a new covering for a range facility that helps with ricochets, you know, something on that line that is a particular discussion point or problem that we might have in the Marine Corps, and they're the ones that are able to help move some of that forward. You know, the, the, the different facilities that we have that use different types of um, concrete that you're able to shoot bullets into and you don't ricochet, right? Industry, and is able to bring differing ideas forward with that, maybe how to patch that. So all of those different things that, that do come from uh, working with, the, and this is Traces, uh, you know, for that sort of thing so that we can promulgate that type of, of data forward to the, to the force. Then, because how good industry is, and a lot of times their, their process is able to move a lot faster than the Marine Corps process is we're able to get some injects from industry to say, if you thought about this, what about that? And they're able to give us a few examples of to help spark some creativity and move things forward. It's not related to just one part of industry or one of our partners there, but it's a, a general generic discussion that allows us to move it forward so that it, it's proper uh, when it comes to the acquisition process. Now, I love that you mentioned the concrete example, because that was one of the first things you and I work together on I don't know, 15 years ago or whatever. Right. So, but if you had, uh, you know, a wish list right now, what sorts of things, problems would you like to see industry solving for you? And if they think they have solutions, how can they come and get them to you? 
So the, the top one is because of increasing capability, even with kinetics, right? Longer ranges, longer lethality, because space is finite with our ranges or training areas, a training round of some sort would really help things, right? And, and whatever, whatever methodology that they choose so that the bullet doesn't go to its max distance like it would with a combat round. So when you say training round, we talk in five, five, six, seven, six, two, mortars, everything, air to ground, air all to ground, of it. everything, okay. anything along that line. So that way, the Marines can still get their live sets and reps with what they need to do for training. But when it's employed in training, it's not going to go to max distance. So it, it takes away. Right, so you're talking about risk now. If if I can't reach the full up rounds maximum distance, but I can do it in training, that's gonna open up all that capability that's gonna be around the range uh, that the Marines are training on there. Or uh, conversely, what it does is they're still getting sets and reps, but in their training with the system and they're still seeing some effects on target because again, some of these longer range and engagement distances, you might not ever see the, the, the effects on target. Then, combined with the sets and reps, as long as you're doing fundamentals of whatever that weapon system is so that it effectively engages a target, whether it's small cow, right? Uh, Side alignment, sight picture. picture right. Spot on, right? Proper focus on a reticle, take your pick. Um, any of that, as long as you're doing that piece in training, that's combat capability because they've already got that muscle memory because they've done sets and reps. And it doesn't matter if it can't reach max distance in some parts of training. Realizing that at some point in time, you need to maximum effective range for that weapon system because they have to be able to, and, and we'll use uh, small cow. If I've got a reduced range round, the effects of weather on that are going to be a lot less if it's short than if I'm doing a longer range engagement, right? So there's still some things that have to be learned with the full up round, but the preponderance if we've got a training round will open up huge capability. And I say training round because that goes to any anything aerial wise, mortar wise, and direct fire, and any any of that. Then to add to it, lasers or even uh, directed energy. If we have a little bit of a less energy output, the system still exercise properly. But if that hazardous energy is kept to a little bit more of a manageable distance, it will open up huge training opportunities as well. Right. Okay. Well, so. That's some homework assigned to our industry partners. And uh, for some of that, I imagine they can come to you. For some of that, they probably do better bringing it to uh, the program op the program managers here at Systems Command, who would be responsible for, for picking that stuff up or showing it to us at Modern Day Marine or some exactly. other Xbox. Yep. So. And, and then we can in, engage with the PMs, right, so that we're meeting the PMs requirements as well as what we're, we're trying to do to, to enable easier training for the force. So, Carlos, before I let you go, I would be remiss if I didn't mention your father. Gunnery Sergeant Carlos Hathcock is a legend in the Marine Corps, uh, decorated Marine sniper, 93 confirmed kills in Vietnam. He has an M21 variant named after him. Truly, truly a Marine Corps legend. Tell us about what it was like growing up with him as your father and how he influenced your career path. So, I, I chuckle because when I look back, especially before I decided to enlist in the Marine Corps, he was just dad. All, all of the figures that I grew up with that are Marine Corps shooting icons and legends, um, they, I, I, you don't know. I, I hear him talking, you know, and, and, and I went to the range sometimes. Uh, I, you just, I didn't know. He's the guy that makes you breakfast in the morning and cooks a burger in the afternoon? Oh, no, not quite like that, mind you, because Dad was a bit of a disciplinarian. Okay. So there was the Marine Corpsism that was impressed upon me. Again, I didn't realize it at the time um, as I was growing up. But you're right. To, to your point, yes, he was Dad, the one that made sure I didn't do things incorrectly. And if I did, I was corrected on the spot uh, quite quickly as well. Um, but that, that is one piece of it, but also growing up, you know, I started shooting small bore when I was a kid here at Quantico, you know, in the, the, the mid to late seventies. 
So a lot of those Marine Corps shooting icons were no kidding my starting off coaches uh, as well with small bore out at Weapons Training Battalion here. So to dad's credit, dad wasn't coaching his own kid, uh, you know, so he was, I was working with other ones, but he was always there, right? They're always the constant pres- presence when I'm shooting. And, and here's an aside story, right, uh, on Carlos. I, I almost didn't go in the Marine Corps. A buddy of mine and I went to go see the Navy recruiter because I was a naval JROTC in high school at the time. Okay. We went to go see the Navy recruiter. Well, the Navy recruiter wasn't there. So both my buddy and I were standing outside the recruiter's door, and staff sergeant that, that was the Marine recruiter goes, hey, you want to come talk to me? Like, literally, that's what he said. And that's where we entered him, and we're like, oh, piece of cake. We can go on buddy program. We'll be able to enlist. And the, and the other guy was there, so we kind of totally forgot about that. Hindsight being 2020, that's awesome because nothing against our naval brethren, but I am glad I didn't spend 20 plus years on boats. I, I had enough boat time as a Marine, and I'm glad that that was enough of my experience for that. So overall, that worked out really good. The, the other piece with that was my dad had absolutely no influence on me going in the Marine Corps or not. He was perfectly happy with me going in the Navy. Didn't say boo about it. Didn't push me to the Marine Corps or do anything else. The only time he had an impression upon my career or what I was going to do with my life after I made the decision to come in the Marine Corps was when I was sitting sitting in the living room. Uh, because I was still underage, I was doing uh, delayed entry. And so my mom and dad had to sign off on me coming in the Marine Corps. So we sitting in his chair. Mom was sitting in her area on the couch. The recruiter was uh, off on the side looking right at dad. And and the recruiter said to me, well, what do you want to do when you go in the Marine Corps? It's like, well, I think I want to do infantry or, you know, I want to shoot or maybe be an MP. The only time my dad ever said anything and, and he piped up real quick was no. What you do in the Marine Corps is finite. And, and don't forget at that time, my dad was disabled. His health was failing. All the things that happened with Vietnam. And, and in the, the, the early 80s, there wasn't much of a call for a retired sniper that was disabled to do things to be able to earn a living. So right. my, my, my early years of high school, things were tough for us because retirement whether he was disabled, all of that. But dad piped up right then and said, no, I want you to have the Marine Corps teach you some sort of skill. I don't care what it is, but I want them to teach you a skill. Luckily, I had a high enough scores that I kind of picked what I wanted to do, so I went aviation option. You know, but overall, up even to that point and then beyond, he never overtly, I don't know what he did behind the scenes, mind you, uh, but overtly, never did anything about my career, about pushing it. His, his message was always to me, and, and it was everything. Every ending conversation that we had was always, I love you and be a good Marine. You know, so those, those things I take to heart that he impressed on me. Well, I think that is solid advice from any parent for any kid. You know, if you're going to go in the military, use the military to help you long-term and short-term whether it's getting the, the college money or learning a skill. So yeah. kudos to your dad for, yep. for giving you that advice. Yeah. Part of my growing experience too, and I was fortunate, I was able to be Lance Corporal Hathcock for a few years before people outside the shooting community started noticing the name because of the book. Right. You know, the book started becoming uh, a lot more popular, you know, 86, 87. So by then I'm Lance Corporal, make your mistakes and not overly be noticed, Hathcock turning into Corporal Hathcock, uh, and then the the name started to be noticed. That, that to me, was also the time that I started picking up the shooting stuff. And and I was trying to learn at that time, you can still excel and make little small mistakes and you can still be a winner. Right. right? And and I always heard people saying, oh, that's Hathcock up there, you know, and, and, and those things go along with shooting. But as part of my growing thing was, and, and, Thank God again, dad said, don't go into the infantry, right? So I took my own path and that helped me kind of cope with, hey, look, I can still be a fairly good shooter uh, and, and, and do well 
even with the shadow that I am walking in and I'm still my own Marine, my own man and, and kind of treading my path within the Marine Corps. Wow. Uh, the Marine Corps has been blessed to have your father and yourself continues to be blessed with you working over at RTAM. So thank you for coming in today. Really, I appreciate you all uh, asking me to come out. You bet. So around here, we've got this uh, thing we do at the, uh, the end of every episode. We call it our lightning round. So are you ready to answer those questions? All set. So when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? A trash man. A trash man. Any regrets? None. All right, good deal. <laughs> if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? Chesty Puller. Chesty Puller, another legend in the Marine Corps. Nice choice. Do you have any tips for maintaining a work-life balance? My tips would probably not be relevant because I'm told quite often that my work-life balance is a bit upset. Is that Sue telling you that? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sorry to hear that. Yep. Or I'm sorry, Sue, to hear that. So, what is a TV show, book, movie, or podcast that you'd recommend? Goes without saying, 93 confirmed kills. Right. Green Sniper. Green Sniper. Uh, easy read. But on the, on the other side, I, I don't watch a lot of TV. So. I, I don't have a whole bunch on that one other than dad's book, of course. So I read Marine Sniper. It was uh, on the ROTC reading list when I was in college. And so that's why when I ran into you in my career, uh, one of my early questions to you was, he's your dad, right? So <laughs> so good deal. Marine Sniper, excellent book. Uh, right on. I highly recommend it. So again, Carlos, thank you for coming in and, and being on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes to leave us a review, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Until next time, stay safe. This is Trip Elliott, signing off.